Biobalance HealthCast, episode 272, Women, Before You Begin Testosterone Replacement. Biobalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of Biobalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. In our last podcast, we had a conversation about trying to fight through the fog and clamor of noise, electronic noise and media noise in the world today to have a nuanced conversation about anything. And in that podcast, we were trying to have a nuanced conversation about medical decision making in terms of men and testosterone replacement. Mm -hmm. Well, I thought it would be beneficial if we could have a similar conversation uh, about women and the replacement of testosterone. Mm-hmm. And in trying to prepare for that, one of the points that you kept making to me is that there are so many variants that have to be considered that it almost has to be a nuanced conversation anyway. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you talk about women under 40 who are losing testosterone or who are suffering the symptoms of TDS. Mm-hmm. It might not be because they're losing testosterone. It might be for some other reasons which I want you to talk about, Mm -hmm. and then women over 40 who are losing testosterone. Mm -hmm. So I guess the global point to make to start the conversation is that as we age, men or women as we age, we begin to lose the volume and quality of hormone production that we had in our younger Mm -hmm. lives. And that that's one of the the issues that contributes to the deficits and damage of aging. Right. And then if we can replace the quality and volume of those hormones, the balance of those hormones Mm -hmm. later or whenever we need to, that Mm -hmm. we can reestablish a healthy normal. That's true. That's true. And we don't, you know, nobody talks about testosterone. So it's not not for women, for women, but it's not a factor. We don't consider it a factor in health of women. Right. So when we do like, if we give a medication, we look at all the things that it affects. Right. But we never look at testosterone. Well, like birth control pills. Right. That's right. So we give, so young women go on birth control pills and we have our highest levels of testosterone. They're peaking in our teens. Okay. Okay. So it may be a great idea for teens who in America aren't supposed to be making babies yet. I mean, that's the social norm. To, and who should not be promiscuous because their brain hasn't caught up with their sexuality, that we put them on birth control pills to just not only protect them from pregnancy, but lower that sex drive a little bit. 28-day vitamins. Absolutely. I mean, if that, we do it often, when I was just doing gynecology, mothers would come in and say, oh, she has acne. Mm. Then we need, you know, we need to get her on birth control pills, or they'd say she has painful periods. <laughs> and you say the kind of acne that makes her pregnant? <laughs> no, I no, you didn't, didn't say that. This is a very sensitive issue, and they. Well, I know need, it is. I, and, I'm being disrespectful. And, and I'll, I'll be I understand. I mean, I'm reading the language of the mother. Right. I have to read the language of the mother of a minor. Who is saying to me, oh, my gosh, she's had a boyfriend for a year. Or something's going to happen. Or now, something's already happening. Or already happening, right. and she's been lucky so far, and we don't want her getting married at 15. Right. So, And we don't believe in abortion, maybe. Or we don't, yeah. you well, know, and, so, and my patients in general in this city are very pro-life. So that was not an option. So we, and, and I, 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 I am too, so. I mean, I don't perform and never have abortions. So it was very important to prevent pregnancy. Whatever reason they came in with, I knew that the measure, actually the message was, please put my daughter on birth control pills to keep her from getting pregnant. And and the other message was, and to stop her from going crazy all the time and, you know, being sexual. You, you really think the moms knew that it would reduce the <laughs> yeah. sex drive? I think they did. Because maybe they'd experienced that in their own life? Yeah. Because that's not until you told me that, that wasn't anything that I had ever heard. I think the moms know it. No one talks about it, actually. Right. I, I don't it's think another I, one of those women's knowledge thing? Yeah. 
I, I don't belong to the secret club. I don't actually think. I mean, usually the women's knowledge thing is always in Glamour magazine or Family Circle or don't read you know, those. I actually do because I want to know what people are talking about. Sure, but I don't see that kind of thing in those. They talk about sex all the time and hormones, but not that. So it does provide a a, a social function. Yeah, as as we're calming our children down, you know, in other countries and other ages, people had their children when they were 13. Mm -hmm. That was fine. That was what they did. Right. We we have a very extended adolescence, and for us to extend adolescence to 20-something, we have to prevent childbearing. Mm -hmm. And we have to prevent too much sexuality so they don't get they don't our children don't get sexually transmitted diseases because they don't have the self-control to always use condoms. So we know who they are. We know what they do. We just have to help them with their desires. Yeah. But then we get to 20-something. They are mature adults. They have self-control, and they're still on the pill. They're now getting ready to get married or have a, a long-term relationship, and they come to me and say, or they came to me and said, I don't know what's wrong with me, but my sex drive's gone. Right. Well, that makes sense because they had a excessive sex drive when they were in their teens. Now it's normalizing. It's their testosterone levels coming down, and that and the pill is suppressing it so much that they don't feel sexual anymore. So they then have a problem. It's a couple problem. It's a self-esteem problem. Right. They don't feel sexy. The other things is they're tired. They're tired. They don't have good muscle mass. Their exercise is, they don't feel like they're getting anything out of exercise. They, they have uh, poor stamina. They can't run their half marathons anymore. They feel old. And and that's how low testosterone makes you feel. So the pill is now suppressing their testosterone level along with estrogen and progesterone to, to a low level, to too low. And you know, and we've talked about this before, that if we were on no pill, right. women make three times as much testosterone as estrogen. Yeah. But the same, the same FSH and LH stimulate estrogen and testosterone from the ovary. That's where it's made. So we have to consider that it stopped the overstimulation and left them with with enough testosterone. Mm -hmm. But now, as their production goes down, it's now making it too low. Okay. Okay. So it can also do that with estrogen. Right. Many women on low dose estrogen pills, est estrogen birth control pills, have vaginal pain. They get what I call old lady bottom. They yeah. don't have any lubrication with sex. They Their vagina shrinks. They get bladder infections all the time because their bladder is estrogen sensitive. And it's really because of the birth control pill we gave them. Now, So then they start playing chemistry set. So they're taking the birth control to avoid being pregnant. They're having these side effects as a result of the birth control they're pill. They're taking antibiotics. So they have to take other medicines. They're taking other medicines, yeah. Off to, so it's like, you know, they tell the stories about rock stars like Elvis Presley. You know, you, you take drugs to get up for the concert, you take drugs to come down from the concert. This isn't quite that, because these are actually drugs that are prescribed by a doctor. Well, but most yes, doctors don't actually think about that. They, they think birth control pill, no pregnancy. They don't think about the fact that it's decreasing the estrogen so low that the vagina is atrophic or thin and now they're going to have all these infections yeast infections are very common all because of no estrogen and no testosterone so we've given our kids pills that shut down all of these normal functions okay so as a guy not knowing any of this stuff do these young girls in your case obviously they brought them to a gynecologist mm -hmm. but I've heard stories teaching high school, teaching college. A lot of them just go to a doctor and get put on the pill. And maybe those doctors uh, don't know all that you know because they don't. they're not gynecologists. They don't because I have I have lots of doctors that are like, oh, you need to go see a specialist for your for your vag vaginal atrophy and you know, yeah. but they're on a low estrogen pill and have been for and have been years. for a while. And they so to you that's 
obvious. So to me, that's a one synapse decision. Yeah. We put you on a higher estrogen pill or better yet, we put you on the Mirena IUD, which is a safe IUD, an IUD that has a little bit of progesterone in it. So it decreases your cycles, unlike the other IUDs that increase them, increase the bleeding. And it's not enough to suppress your ovaries. So your ovaries are still making all your hormones. Okay. We we have articles all the time about in, in our journals about why do all the women now have osteoporosis? Well, if you check a blood level of somebody on birth control pills, it suppresses their estrogen so low that it's in menopausal range. So, so we're just putting you in menopause. 20 years early. Right. So they're losing bone because they're on the pill. Yeah. Now, when I, w- when I was, I wasn't on the pill because I didn't do well with it. But when I was in college, we had high higher dose estrogen pills that did not cause okay. osteoporosis. It gave us enough estrogen to make bone, mm-hmm. but it did shut down our testosterone, which increased the loss of libido. Libido and and it does decrease the loss the growth of bone. Yeah, it does by by decreasing by decreasing the testosterone. But there was enough estrogen there to maintain the bone. So it was a different pill then. And they found that that pill had side effects, lots of bleeding. So, so my, you know, my common answer is get the Marina IUD and let your ovaries do what they're supposed to be doing. Right. And not ovulating, but do what they're supposed to be doing. Because it does sh- shut down that surge mm-hmm. that causes you to ovulate. There's another thing that many doctors don't really... They just kind of turn their brain off when they're, this is discussed. But often, women will have, if they're having their own cycles and they're not on the pill, right. they'll have a surge, a very high surge of testosterone mid-cycle. That was meant, the, the, the God factor of getting you to have sex right when you're ovulating. Right. So the that, increased likelihood of a successful mating in terms of producing a child. Right. Because really, all the things we go through with periods and all the th- things we go through with the ups and downs of hormones right. have to do with making babies. Okay. That's it. Not with sex as a pleasurable activity or an intimacy activity, but as a procreative activity. Right. I'm sure. I mean, sure, you know, I'm, you know, clearly, I don't know what God's thinking, but I mean, it was. No, but there are churches that will tell you. And, they, and, they will, and intimacy yeah. keeps moms and dads together long enough to get babies Independent, to survive. yeah, mm-hmm. to survive. So, so there's lots of different reasons or right. different reasons we can we can think about. But so, so that's all younger women. That's all and younger women. But we need to. But nobody talks about that. I know, I, and I'm fascinated by what you're saying because that, it, it, and again, having taught and counseled a lot of younger women or families with younger daughters, these are discussions that I've been around for a long time, and I've mm-hmm. never heard this particular take. On what you were discussing. Because the girls aren't talking to their parents about this. They're talking to their doctors about this. They're or, talking in to my experience, teenagers talk to each other. Each other. Their, and their so, most important frame of reference or form of reference for information is another teenager. I used to have all my, my daughter's friends. Yeah. But sitting, you're, you're in a unique situation. Sitting around, yeah. sitting around my counter in my kitchen while I'm making pizza for them. We're going to have biology class. Asking me questions sure. about the pill and all this stuff. And interestingly enough, now that I see them, they often go, well, you didn't tell me that you could get pregnant when you're on the pill. Well, yeah, you can. It does happen. And my guess you know, is, yeah, you did. Yeah, no. They just hear selectively. Yeah, they. I did say that. I yeah. mean, I always tell them that, that kind of thing because yeah. that's important. You know, you could be doing all the right things right. and still... Got pregnant, so you better cho- you better be careful who you choose as partner and hang on, you know, and hang on for yeah the right guy. So 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 step that aside if we can. Mm-hmm. If you're if you're in a place I'm, where we can I'm change, there. and and then talk about women over forty who come to see you and and the decision matrices that you go through mm-hmm. to decide what they need. Well, I look at a sim- symptomology where I give them a list of symptoms before I even see them, and I ask, what symptoms do you have? And the symptoms are fatigue, loss of libido, loss of orgasms, loss of muscle mass, loss of strength, insomnia, new migraines, I mean, all these things, dry vagina, um, 
there's so many things, thin skin, um, loss of hair, all of these things are related to a loss of testosterone. I also asked some questions about hot flashes and, and, um, and dry vagina is also related to estrogen. So I asked them questions about all their hormones and um, if they have the testosterone loss, which many of them, that's all they have is the symptoms of that, especially if they're not menopausal yet, then I know what I'm looking for. Then I look through their lab, their blood work. Right. And I look for low testosterone. Then I look for reasons for low testosterone. I look for high estrogens, high estrones, um, a, a prolactin, a pituitary hormone that is really for lactation. But many people have a high prolactin because they smoke dope, eat dope, whatever. I mean, I guess we should call it grass, THC. I don't know. Yeah. But, but that causes a high prolactin. Lots of psychiatric drugs cause high prolactin, which suppresses testosterone and suppresses estrogen as well. So oftentimes that's the issue, not, not really their ovaries themselves. Mm -hmm. It's a suppression of one thing or another. Sometimes it's a, a liver issue. I have to look at all the, all of the uh, blood tests to make sure are they healthy? Are they not healthy? People who are really sick often shut down their product, their reproductive hormones so that they can expend all their energy on getting better. Mm -hmm. So I have to look for those things too. So I take, I sit down at my desk and put both things in front of me and evaluate this patient before I've seen her. Right. And then say, are there enough symptoms and can I find an answer? Right. So based on the labs and the questionnaire that they've submitted. Right. And then in general with women, it's a little easier because if they have any, I had one person with no symptoms. I'm like, I'm not going to treat you with no symptoms. You're, you know, you're perfectly healthy. But, but that person, I just said, you know, when you get symptoms, come back. Come back. She, she wasn't really old enough. She was 42 or something. Someday she'll have symptoms. She'll be back. But I have I usually have patients with many testosterone loss symptoms right. and then a very low free testosterone. And in women, I don't care what your total is, it's invisible to your body. The free testosterone is the only part your body sees, and that's the only thing I'm going to look at because it's affected by estrogen, it's affected by sex hormone binding globulin. The total is just bound up and inactive and, and, and most of it, except for the free part. So one of the challenges that you have in making this determination when you get the lab data and you talk to them about their symptoms is that the lab data that says <laughs> normal range for women is often not a reliable determinant. When they uh, say normal, they don't mean healthy or optimal or functional they, without symptoms. They mean... They, they actually, they have a terrible. They don't really know what the range sort is. Of There's average lots for this cohort, or at, average for men with. A, I think they pull it out of their fact. hat. Honestly, I don't think "hat" was the word you used off camera, but I know. You're right. But yes, they. Just I think they do because I've talked to the head of Quest, which is a huge mm -hmm. lab. I mean, the medical director, and I said, so they used to have normal free testosterone for all women of any age was zero. Huh. To 1.2, which is like nothing. Yeah. That range is, isn't is normal. I guess if you had people on birth control pills, it might be what they call average or normal. So I talked to him about it, and, and so he couldn't give me any reason, any studies, any right. anything. But so it turns out that like mm, six months later, it said 0.2 to 1.2. Because my argument was zero is never normal. Yeah, yeah. So, so, they, so they listen to you. <laughs> on one end of the spectrum, right? And but but in the groups of preventive medicine and hormone doctors that yeah. I'm in, yeah. we've determined that young women making their own testosterone without being on, or not on pills, or not on anything suppressive, yeah. who are healthy and have normal sex lives and no symptoms, yeah. are have a level of seven. Seven. Not. Not one point two. Not zero to one point two. Wow. Seven. So. That's, so you have to factor that into your... So I have to write in normals all over my lab t test because they also say that when somebody has no estrogen, that it's normal. So when because doctors when that don't know menopause. what you know or don't do what you they do... They just look down the line, they go, you're what, normal. 
what your patients are bringing them. They see all my writing on it because I'm writing the normals that I know are optimal or normal for young, healthy women. Mm -hmm. But they don't get it. I mean, FSH, which is the hormone that goes way up when you don't have any estrogen, gives you hot flashes, makes you miserable, causes some people anxiety attacks. That is considered normal when it's way out of range for a healthy young woman. But I'm a patient of yours for men's issues Mm -hmm. for this, and I'm a patient of another physician for (laughs) general health issues. And you guys dance together. You talk to each other. You send data points back and forth. So I'm happy with that. But what about people whose doctors don't interact with you or Or respect what you do? Or they say... (laughs) <laughs> or just they say, say oh, that's just not right you yeah. know but, but they've never really thought through what right. the normals mean for some yeah. tests they've never really thought through how they got there uh-huh. so i mean you have to do some research to figure it out and but you're very good about sending them information yeah. if they're open to receiving it you'll give them the data you'll give them mm-hmm. the research you'll give them your rationale mm-hmm. i do but many of them just say oh that yeah. and if they do that their patients usually get a new doctor. They don't realize they're not hurting me. Right. I've already proven to my patients that those symptoms are gone when I treat you with this. When well, you treat because somebody, because if they go off of what you're doing, their symptoms it all come comes back. back. So, so I mean, it's pretty easy. A leads to B. They know that what they're on is right, and they don't have the side of any side effects. So it's not too much. Right. So so the the catch that many of the male doctors male doctors get hooked on is that the total testosterone could be in the male range. It could be three hundred just to get enough free testosterone for that patient to function. Now the free testosterone's not high. Right. It's just it just is that that patient has a very small active part. Of testosterone, so I have to make them have a lot of testosterone to just get enough for them to function. Okay, so what we talked about today is <laughs> decision matrices for testosterone replacement. Right, and what there, you can do. There are other hormones that also decline and also need mm-hmm. to be replaced and also have symptoms and also require decision matrices. Mm-hmm. If you're interested in those, check out our book, The Secret Female Hormone, because we, we talk about testosterone, we talk about estrogen, and we talk about progesterone in terms Growth of checklists hormone, and symptomology mm-hmm. that you then can take to your doctor and say, look, can we talk about this? And we would encourage you to do so. Thanks for listening. Much. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.